I'll give everybody a minute to log in. Hello, my name is Jessica Gibson. I'm CEO and co-founder of Aerial Precision Medicine. We are a clinical genomics laboratory dedicating to helping patients with complex pancreatic diseases. Really grateful to co-host this educational web webinar today with the National Pinkers Foundation with Dr. Celeste Shelton and Katja Arlova. And wanna take this opportunity to welcome David, the new Chief Executive Officer of the National Pinkers Foundation to introduce himself. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, we're really pleased and thankful to be uh, working with Aerial Precision Medicine on projects throughout the year. So thanks for giving me an opportunity to just give a brief overview of the National Pancreas Foundation. And NPF is a 23-year-old national organization headquartered in Bethesda, Maryland. And we truly are the only nonprofit 501c3 in the entire country that deals with all types of pancreas disease. Uh, including the acute pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis, pancreatic cancer, FCS, and also pediatric uh, pancreatitis. So we're really pleased to, you know, hit all the areas of pancreas disease. And when we're talking about NPF, we talk about two business silos. The first one is really focused on our patients. Uh, and our second business silo is working with the med medical community. On the patient side of the business, uh, we are working on launching a patient registry, a national patient registry, and we're really pleased to, you know, just work out the kinks and really partner with Ariel on that registry, so we're really pleased on that. The second project that has been in place for a number of years is an uh, animated pancreas, uh, pancreas patient, where it's an animation where patients and family members uh, family members can better understand the dynamics of the pancreas and have a better relationship with their clinicians and medical professionals. We also have state chapters throughout the country where patients and family members can really work at advocacy uh, levels on the uh, state level, as well as host small fundraising events. And then finally and briefly, on the medical side of the work of NPF, we have research grants that uh, we grant every year uh, to uh, medical professionals and clinicians and researchers in the amount of $50,000 per grant to really make an impact on cure and pancreas disease. The other thing we do is uh, an annual fellow symposium where we invite young uh, up and coming uh, pancreas disease uh, clinicians and we partner them up with mentors who have been in the space for a number of years so they can make a lifelong commitment to pancreas disease and really get support from MPF. Uh, we really like to get people involved in volunteering on the committee structure. So if you have some interest, our website is uh, www.pancreasfoundation.org. So Jessica, thank you again for allowing us to partner uh, with your company and thanks for the opportunity to explain MPF to your audience. Great, and we'll pass it over right now to Dr. Shelton and allow her to um, start this educational webinar on genetics and clinical care. Hello, and thank you for joining today for our webinar. Today, we're gonna to be talking about genetics and clinical care. We'll be giving an overview and discussing some benefits and limitations. My name is Celeste Shelton. I have degrees in genetic counseling and human genetics, and I'm a variant scientist at Aerial Precision Medicine. I'm joined by Katya Orlova, who has a background in genetic counseling, human genetics, and public health. And she is also a variant scientist at Aerial Precision Medicine. Today, we're going to review some genetics basics, followed by a discussion of genetic testing and some of its applications. We'll review the types of results you may get back and provide some additional information on benefits, limitation, limitations, and direct to consumer testing. Please keep in mind that genetics and clinical care is a massive topic and therefore we will not be able to cover everything today. If you're considering genetic testing or you have genetic test results in hand that you wanna know more about, we recommend that you speak with a genetic counselor who can spend more time giving you a personalized assessment and discussing genetic testing options that are appropriate for you. We are planning to have some time for a question and answer at the end. Um, so please share any questions that you may have in the question box. Those questions will only be visible to the moderators. So, so to begin, 
begin, we're going to turn our cameras off and Katya is going to start us off by discussing some basics of human genetics. All right, so starting from the very beginning, we have DNA, which stores information on how the body develops and functions. We have a copy of DNA in every cell of our body. DNA has its own alphabet of, um, made up of nucleotides that correspond to <clears throat> four letters, A, G, T, and C. And some stretches of DNA form discrete units called genes. And each gene gives instructions for a specific function in the body. These instructions ultimately help form proteins, which are then able to play a role in the various functions. Whoops. As an example, uh, one of the proteins that the pancreas produces is called trypsinogen, which is ultimately activated into trypsin, a digestive enzyme that helps you digest your food. Um, next, you may have heard the word chromosomes. Uh, chromosomes, pictured here, are long strands of DNA along which genes are laid out. Humans have about 22,000 genes distributed across their chromosomes. Our chromosomes are arranged in pairs. We have two copies of 23 chromosomes for a total of 46. The first 22 pairs of chromosomes are identical between men and women, while the 23rd chromosome pair is XX in females and XY in males. Because most chromosomes come in identical pairs, it means there are two copies of most genes. For example, the gene CFTR is located on chromosome 7. So one copy of CFTR is on one copy of the seventh chromosome, while the second copy of the gene is on the other. Although humans are very similar to one another from a genetic standpoint, we do have some differences in how our DNA is spelled, called genetic variants. In this example, we have two people, Emily and Brian, and their hypothetical genes. You'll notice that although Emily and Brian's genes are nearly identical, at position eight, Emily has a G, while Brian has a T. Brian has what's called a genetic variant at that position. While most genetic variants are harmless and create the interpersonal variation of different hair colors and heights, some are harmful and can result in negative consequences for the protein made or result in no protein made at all. Depending on the gene and type of variant, there can be different consequences on the protein level. In this diagram, Emily's gene represents the typical way that proteins are instructed to be created. She doesn't have any harmful variants in her gene that cause the protein to malfunction. John's gene, on the other hand, has a genetic variant that leads to a protein being more active than usual. An example of a genetic variant that does this is the R122H variant in the gene PRSS1 that is one of the causes of hereditary pancreatitis. The hyperactivity of this protein results in prolonged action of the digestive enzyme trypsin and the symptoms of pancreatitis. Laura's genetic variant causes the protein building blocks to be properly created, but the protein isn't able to fold itself into the correct shape. Misfolded proteins can cause stress on a cellular level and also increase risk for pancreatitis. And finally, variant causes the protein to be made properly, um, but in lower quantity, impacting the function that the protein was meant to play in the body. For example, reduced production and function of the CFTR protein increases risk for pancreatitis. Because people have two copies of most genes, it's possible to have more than one copy of any given variant. If a person has just one copy of a variant in one gene, while their second copy of the gene on the other chromosome isn't affected, the person is said to be heterozygous for the variant. If both copies of the gene have the variant, a person's considered to be homozygous for the variant. Typically, it's more harmful to be homozygous for a given harmful variant than to be heterozygous, but in some cases, there's no difference. So what is genetic testing? Genetic testing 
is a medical test performed in a laboratory. It identifies changes in a person's DNA that are associated with disease. Genetic tests can confirm or rule out a suspected genetic condition. They can determine a person's chance of developing a genetic condition. And they may determine a person's chance of passing on a genetic condition. Different types of genetic testing are available and used across different stages of a person's life. Carrier screening is genetic testing to determine if a healthy individual or two healthy partners have a chance of passing on a genetic condition. Pre-implantation genetic testing may be available for individuals or couples with a chance to have a child with a genetic condition for which in vitro fertilization followed by pre-implantation genetic diagnosis can be used to determine which embryos have the genetic disease being screened for. Prenatal genetic testing is used during when there is concern for a genetic condition, such as from carrier screening of the parents for abnormalities in an ultrasound or lab results. Newborn screening is testing babies for genetic conditions in the first few days of life. The conditions screened for vary by states. And the testing enables the detection and early treatment of specific conditions before babies may start showing those signs and symptoms. And finally, diagnostic testing facilitates the diagnosis of a genetic disorder in an affected individual at any stage of their life. It can be used also to predict a later onset genetic condition in a healthy individual provide information on how an individual may respond to specific drugs. This can help doctors decide what drug to begin with and what dose. And genetic testing can be used to test tumors to personalize cancer treatments. Other applications include forensics, direct-to-consumer genetic testing, such as ancestry testing, and research. There are two major techniques for genetic testing that you may have heard of, sequencing and genotyping. Sequencing involves reading through a gene or section of DNA to determine how an entire section is spelled. It's the most comprehensive way of looking for changes in genes or elsewhere that may contribute to disease. Genetic sequencing tests can be several different sizes. Site-specific testing looks for a specific disease-causing variant that's been identified in other family members so you know exactly what you're looking for. Single gene testing is testing for variants in a single gene when a person's features or family history are highly specific to a single gene. Gene panels are the most common. These are tests that look for variants in several genes that are associated with the patient's features or their family history. Whole exome sequencing refers to sequencing all genes that code for proteins. The exome refers to every protein coding section of DNA. Whole exome is used for patients whose clinical features are highly suggestive of a genetic condition, but either previous genetic testing is negative or several gene panels are indicated, making exo much cheaper than ordering multiple tests. And finally, whole genome sequencing is testing all DNA, including the spaces between genes. However, more information is not always better, partly because there's a lot that we still don't know about how certain variants contribute to disease, and it may also identify additional information about your health that you may not want to know. Genotyping, on the other hand, looks at specific letters or words in your DNA. They can provide a comprehensive look at genes, and for this reason, are not as commonly used as medical tests right now. Instead, they tell you if you have specific changes that have been associated with disease, and although they provide less information, they do tend to be cheaper. So here we have an example of three letters that are unchanged. And then here, we have a C to G change in the middle. However, if there are any unexpected variants outside of these three letters we're looking at right here, they're not going to be detected. Now, how does the genetic testing process work? 
Although the process does vary by context and the reason for testing, there are three main phases, the pretest process, the genetic test itself, and the post-test disclosure of those results. First, a patient may consult with their clinical care provider about genetic testing, though more commonly a provider may recommend evaluation for genetic testing based on a person's medical and family history. An evaluation may occur to determine if genetic testing should be offered, and if so, what test? This may involve a specialist for an exam and seeing a genetic counselor to review your personal and family history. If you or your child is eligible for genetic testing, you'll be provided with information about the test, how it works, and the benefits and limitations so that you can make a fully informed choice to either move forward with or decline genetic testing. If you decide to move forward with genetic testing, you'll need to provide a sample which will depend on the test. Common samples include blood, saliva, or cheek swabs. However, sample collection may be more invasive depending on the type of tissue that is needed, such as some tests during pregnancy or tumor testing. Time frame sample collection to results varies by the test and the laboratory, but they're typically returned within several weeks. Once those results are returned, your genetic counselor or clinical care provider will discuss the results with you and what they mean for you and your family. So now that we've reviewed the basics of genetics and the general logistics of genetic testing, how is this applied in testing for a single gene or Mendelian disease? And how is that different uh, from how it's used for testing for complex disease? So first of all, what do we mean uh, when we talk about single gene or Mendelian disease? We're talking about diseases that are caused by changes in one or both copies of a single gene. For example, Sickle cell anemia is caused by variants in both copies of the gene HBB. And similarly, cystic fibrosis is caused by variants in both copies of the gene CFTR. Hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome, or HBOC, is another example caused by heterozygous variants in the gene BRCA1 or in the gene BRCA2. And Huntington disease is caused by heterozygosity for harmful genetic variants in the gene HTT. Single gene diseases can have onset at any age, and the ones shown here are onset in childhood or in adulthood, uh, but other Mendelian diseases can manifest even sooner in utero. When we do genetic testing for single gene diseases, there can be a number of different goals. A person who is affected by a disease may be looking for a diagnosis and get diagnostic testing. Predictive testing, is for unaffected people who are interested in understanding their risk to develop disease, for example, due to a family history of cancer, and to potentially prevent its complications through screening. Carrier screening um, is another subtype of testing that's for people to do before conception or during pregnancy to determine their risk for having a child with a disease. For example, carrier screening for cystic fibrosis is one of the most commonly done tests during pregnancy, but nowadays it's possible to get screened for hundreds of other diseases at once. Single gene diseases can also follow different so-called inheritance patterns or ways that the disease travels through families. The main ways that rare genetic diseases travel through families are autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, X-linked dominant and X-linked recessive, and de novo. In the next few slides, you'll see how these inheritance patterns work. But in order to visualize how these inheritance patterns work in a family history, you should know that in genetics, males are signified as squares and females are signified as circles. And when we draw families, the parents are connected by a line and the children are drawn below. In this case, there's two sons and two daughters in this example family. So back to inheritance patterns. The first pattern you see illustrated here is 
autosomal dominant. Autosomal means that the harmful genetic variant is located on the non-sex chromosomes, or chromosomes 1 through 22. Dominant means that having one copy of a genetic variant or being heterozygous is sufficient to cause the disease. In this example, the dad is shaded in light green as being affected by the disease. He has one copy of the variant on one of his two chromosomes shown. When the mom and dad go on to pass on their genes to their kids at every pregnancy, the dad can pass on either the unaffected copy of the gene or the gene with the variant. The mom can only pass on the unaffected genes since neither of hers has a harmful variant. So when they go on to have kids, because the dad has a 50-50 chance or a one in two risk of passing on the variant with every pregnancy, the parents have a 50% chance of having their kids inherit the genetic variant and being affected. An example of a disease with this inheritance pattern is PRSS1 hereditary pancreatitis. The, main, um, another, the next main inheritance pattern is autosomal recessive, where autosomal again means the variants on chromosomes 1 through 22. Recessive means that two variants are necessary to cause disease, or one in each copy of the gene. In recessive disease, both parents are carriers. Each has just one copy of a gene with a variant and one copy of a gene with no variant. They are typically unaffected with the disease. In this pattern, 25% of the time, a child will receive two variants and be affected by the disease, such as the son in this uh, situation, the son on the left. Half the time, the kids will be unaffected carriers like their parents, and one quarter of the time, a child will be unaffected and not a carrier. An example of a disease with this inheritance pattern is sickle cell disease. Sometimes disease-related variants are found on one of the 23rd pair of chromosomes or the chromosomes that determine someone's sex. As you know, males have XY chromosomes and females have XX. And at conception, mothers pass on one of their sex chromosomes and fathers pass on one of theirs. And depending on which chromosomes are received, the child can be a son or a daughter. So daughters receive an X chromosome from both parents, while sons receive an X from mom and a Y from dad. So the next inheritance pattern is um, X-linked, meaning that the genetic variant is located on the X chromosome. And in this pattern, X-linked recessive, the word recessive means that two variants are necessary to cause the condition in women, and one variant is necessary in men, because men only have that one copy of the X chromosome. Women who are carriers are not affected because their additional X chromosome is protective, uh, but they can pass on the affected X chromosome and have an affected son. Rarely, women inherit two copies of the variant, one on each X chromosome, and they become affected. In this inheritance pattern, if a woman is a carrier, there's a 50% chance that her sons are affected and a 50% chance that her daughters are carriers like her. An example of a condition with this inheritance pattern is colorblindness. The other X-linked pattern is X-linked dominant, where dominant means that just one variant is necessary to cause a condition in women and in men, regardless of how many X chromosomes they have. And in X-linked dominant conditions, women are not protected by their second copy of the X chromosome and end up having the disease or more frequently are not protected fully and have less severe disease than males. In this inheritance pattern, a woman has a 50-50 chance of having her kids be affected if she um, is affected herself, with boys likely to be more severely affected than girls. An example of a disease with this inheritance pattern is Fragile X syndrome. And the final inheritance pattern is de novo, which means anew or starting from the beginning. This is when a variant arises anew in a child, but neither parent has the disease nor the variant. The variant arises in a parent's reproductive tissues only, like a mother's egg or a father's sperm, or later on in the embryo. In this example, the gene variant is related to an autosomal dominant condition. So the daughter being heterozygous um, leads to her being affected. 
In this case, once the variant arises, the daughter has the typical 50-50 chance of passing on uh, the variant to her kids. However, if the variant were in a gene related to an autosomal recessive condition, she would simply be a carrier. The de novo inheritance pattern has been observed for some pathogenic PRSS1 variants, though it's estimated to account for only 5% of occurrences of hereditary pancreatitis. The rest of the time, um, most of the causes of HP or hereditary pancreatitis are inherited. So for some examples of testing for single gene diseases, um, here's an example of testing for cystic fibrosis, which follows an autosomal recessive uh, inheritance pattern, and it's caused by variants in both copies of the CFTR gene. And in this scenario, um, ben and Lisa want to know their chances of having a child with cystic fibrosis because Ben's aunt has cystic fibrosis. They visit a prenatal genetic counselor who orders a genetic test for, or a single gene test for CFTR. And from this test, they both learn that they each carry a single harmful change in the CFTR gene. They're then counseled that they have a one in four chance of having a child with cystic fibrosis and provided with information on reproductive options. Another example is testing for PRSS1 hereditary pancreatitis. Um, this is, of course, um, autosomal dominant, and it's caused by heterozygous variants in the PRSS1 gene. In this scenario, Amanda is a 10-year-old child with unexplained pancreatitis. And um, she has a history, a family history of pancreatitis in her maternal grandmother. Um, a gastroenterologist orders genetic testing, which identifies a pathogenic variant in PRSS1, and Amanda is diagnosed with hereditary pancreatitis. The family is subsequently counseled on hereditary pancreatitis, its disease course, and who else in the family may be at risk to develop pancreatitis. Now, in contrast to single gene diseases, complex diseases don't have a single genetic cause. Instead, they're caused by combinations of several genetic, environmental, and other factors, which is what makes them complex. Here are just a few complex diseases that you may be familiar with, such as diabetes, asthma, and hypertension. It's important to mention, though, that although these diseases are largely complex, in some cases there may be types of single gene diseases that cause these conditions. For example, as Katya just described, PRSS1 hereditary pancreatitis is a rare single gene cause of pancreatitis, but overall it, count, it, it accounts for a very small percentage of pancreatitis compared to pancreatitis that is complex. You may also hear complex diseases referred to as multifactorial, meaning multiple factors, or polygenic, meaning multiple genes. There are several purposes for genetic testing for complex diseases. Genetic testing can be diagnostic. It may diagnose a disease in an affected individual or identify genetic contributions to disease. In some cases, it may provide prognostic information. If there is data on another patient with the same combination of factors found in that patient, genetic test results may be able to pr provide you with valuable information on disease progression and risk for certain outcomes from the disease. Genetic testing may also have therapeutic implications. In some cases, it may identify targets with available therapies. It may also identify drug response variants that are relevant to which medications may be more effective for you. And finally, it may make a person eligible for existing or future clinical trials, depending on the findings. Now, we call variants that can cause single gene disorder pathogenic variants. These are typically rare variants with strong effects that are sufficient to cause disease alone or in combination with the pathogenic variant on the second copy of the gene, depending on the inheritance pattern. 
risk variants are instead more common in the general population. They don't have strong enough effects to cause disease on their own, but people who develop complex diseases tend to have more risk variants in combination with other contributing factors. When we think about complex disease, we can use the JAR model to illustrate how genetic and environmental risks can add up to cause disease. Each JAR represents a person's risk for a specific complex condition. Here we have Emily and Jason. The circles represent genetic risk variants. When a JAR overflows from the combination of genetic and environmental risk factors, this is when disease results. We are all born with a certain number of genetic risk factors that we inherited by chance. Some of us are born with more than others, such as Jason here. This we can't change. Now, over the course of our lives, we acquire certain environmental risk factors represented by the triangles here. These contribute to filling up, but they can also be removed, for example, by quitting smoking. In this example, although Emily and Jason acquired the same number of environmental risk factors, only Jason's jar overflowed because he had more genetic risk from the beginning and the ones he had had higher impact as shown by the larger circles in his jar. In a family, the risk depends on how many risk variants and which risk variants a child inherits from their parents in addition to environmental factors. So in this example, only one child, a daughter that's shaded in blue, had a jar that overfilled for a specific disease, which is why she is the only one affected in the family. A limitation of genetic testing for complex diseases is that not, not all of the genetic basis for complex diseases is understood. Genetic variants returned through genetic testing do not yet represent all of the genetic variants that predispose to complex disease even though researchers know that there is still an unexplained genetic risk. For example, here we can divide risk for pancreatitis into environmental factors such as alcohol and smoking and genetic risk factors. However, there is still a large proportion of estimated genetic risk that researchers are still working on to cover. We can use testing for unexplained pancreatitis as an example. Complex pancreatitis is multifactorial, and several genes are known to be associated, associated with pancreatitis. In this case, Alice is a 23-year-old who, who has had several episodes of unexplained pancreatitis. She does not have a family history of pancreatic disease. After ruling out other common causes of pancreatitis, a pancreatologist orders genetic testing. From the, the genetic test, a single gene cause is not identified. Instead, genetic testing identifies several genetic risk variants associated with increased risk of early onset pancreatitis. Alice is counseled that her genetic test results, her personal medical history, and her family history are consistent with complex pancreatitis. It just so happens that she is later offered enrollment in a clinical trial that is available based on her genetic test results. For some conditions, genetic testing may return something called a polygenic risk score. A polygenic risk score incorporates a person's genotype at several different risk positions associated with disease. The purpose is to determine how their risk for disease compares to other people in the population, particularly in an unaffected or healthy individual. They don't tell you absolute risk, but rather estimate relative risk. In this example, we have a person without the three variants that is placed in a low risk group. And in the second example, we have a person with all three risk variants that is then placed in a high risk group. There are several limitations though, including that they don't test every variant associated with disease and they don't provide a comprehensive look at specific genes. 
there are variable degrees of accuracy of a polygenic risk score as well. However, a benefit is that they can identify individuals who may benefit from risk-reducing interventions or increased screening. Further, testing may be cheaper if genotyping is used rather than sequencing. Now, we've discussed single gene diseases and complex diseases. I want to bring up a third major type of genetic disease, which is a chromosome disorder. Katya had showed us that we have 46 chromosomes, or 23 pairs, that contain our DNA. Chromosome disorders result from large changes to chromosomes um, that can cause disease. There can be large deletions or duplications, structural rearrangements, an extra chromosome, or a missing chromosome. An example that many people are familiar with is Down syndrome, and this can be caused by an extra third copy on chromosome 21. So what are the types of genetic test results that you can expect to receive from genetic testing? Possible genetic testing um, results include uh, genetic variants like pathogenic variants, which are defined as those that cause disease, likely pathogenic variants, uh, which are those that have a high probability of being pathogenic, but there isn't enough research on the particular variant to classify it definitively. Variants of uncertain significance, or VUSs, are variants that may be pathogenic or likely pathogenic or may be benign and simply represent harmless interpersonal variation. There's insufficient research to know either way uh, or there may be conflicting evidence as to the role of the VUS in disease. Over time and as more scientific research accumulates, VUSs can be reclassified. If genetic testing companies return risk variants, you're likely to see a similar classification scheme for those, except that risk variants, as opposed to pathogenic variants, are those that solely predispose to disease but do not actually cause disease in isolation. They have a lower impact than pathogenic variants and tend to be more common in the population. Likely risk variants are those uh, that are highly likely to be a risk variant, um, but there is insufficient information to definitively classify them. And uncertain risk variants are those with insufficient info to be classified or with conflicting evidence for or against uh, risk. It's important to note that because some risk variants are common in the population, most patients will be found to have several variants in their test results. One point to remember about variants of uncertain significance is that they should not be used to guide medical management decisions. One of the reasons for this is that most VUSs in the long term are reclassified as benign. There are several benefits and limitations of genetic testing. Some benefits include they can identify the genetic cause of disease, providing a diagnosis and reducing further workup. They can end the diagnostic odyssey that so many patients with genetic diseases go through. Genetic variants can inform disease treatment and management, and they may also provide valuable information on disease progression. And genetic testing may facilitate testing of other family members as well. And finally, in some cases, genetic diagnosis may open up eligibility for specific clinical trials, either now or in the future. Some limitations are that some genetic test results don't yet have guidelines for treatment. And for some variants, the exact disease risk due to the variant is not yet completely understood. You may receive uninformative test results or uncertain test results 
um, such as Katya had just explained with a variant of uncertain significance. And this is more likely to occur with a larger genetic test that tests more genes. Another ma major limitation of genetic testing is that most research has been done in European populations. Other ethnic and racial groups may have additional variants that increase risk that are not yet known or not yet classified. This means that there may be a gene that's in, not important for Europeans, but it is important for a disease in another population that has not yet been discovered. Persons of Euro non-European ancestry are more likely to have genetic test results containing variants of uncertain significance for which there just isn't enough information yet to know if the disease is, to know if the variant is harmless or if it's involved in disease. Furthermore, variants found in European populations may have different risk impacts in other populations. There are several research initiatives ongoing to resolve this, this disparity and provide more valuable genetic insights for individuals of non-European history, but this still remains a main limitation. Several laws do exist to protect your genetic information and prevent genetic discrimination. HIPAA is a federal law that provides privacy standards to protect your medical records, and this includes genetic test information. Laws also exist to protect you from discrimination based on your genetic test results on both the federal and the state level. The Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act of 2008, or GINA, is a federal law that prohibits genetic discrimination in employment and health insurance. GINA does not cover long-term care, disability, or life insurance, and does not apply to certain groups such as members of the military, though additional state-specific and group-specific protections do exist. Now, insurance coverage is a frequent concern expressed by patients receiving genetic testing. Insurance may cover genetic testing if specific criteria are met for a particular test, or if it's recommended by a doctor, though, though not always. If you have concerns or questions about if your insurance will cover a genetic test, you can speak with your genetic counselor, doctor, or other provider. They'll be able to provide you with some additional information and help make a plan with you to address your concerns. You can contact your insurance company to see if they'll cover the test and what their criteria are for coverage. Your doctor or genetic counselor can submit a medical, medic, letter of medical necessity on your behalf to petition for insurance coverage. You can also speak with the laboratory through which the genetic test is being run. They may be able to contact your insurance company for you and there may also be programs in place to help you pay out of pocket if insurance will not cover the test, including financial assistance, a reduced price compared to what they would bill insurance, or a payment program. Next, um, direct to consumer or DTC testing for short is genetic testing that doesn't necessarily involve a healthcare provider or health insurance. These tests um, can now be bought almost anywhere in malls and over the internet, and there's a really large variety of them. Uh, some of them provide health information, while others are more recreational and give information about things like genetic ancestry and predicting common traits, like, for example, whether you're disgusted by the flavor of cilantro or not. Direct-to-consumer testing has some important differences with clinical or medical genetic testing. Because DTC testing does not involve a healthcare provider, the appropriateness of the test for a given person isn't evaluated, which can result in missing important health conditions if the patient orders the wrong test. Both clinical and direct-to-consumer tests return health-related information, but the scope of DTC testing tends to be much more narrow and be limited to some carrier screening or a fraction of the variants that can cause Mendelian diseases. 
DTC tests typically offer genotyping, while the clinical tests use whatever technology is appropriate for the patient's condition and their medical and family histories. One important point to remember about DTC genotyping tests is that their quality can vary, whereas clinical grade tests must meet federal guidelines for quality. For this reason, health-related DTC test results must be confirmed in a clinical grade lab if they're to be used for making medical management decisions. In contrast with clinical genetic testing selected by a clinician, insurance does not cover DTC testing. And once you receive results through DTC genotyping, you typically get a static report. Whereas in clinic, you also get a report, but then your test results are also contextualized within your family and medical histories, and potential follow-up in medical care or screening can occur. One final cautionary note regarding using DTC testing for health results is that some people will download their raw DTC data from the company and run it through a third-party interpretation tool on the internet to find additional medical genetic test results not provided by the DTC company. However, this can lead to highly inaccurate results in one study, they showed that 40% of test results gathered this way were in fact false positives when subsequently tested through a clinical lab. So it's important to be careful. All right, so this is the end of our short overview of um, the use of genetics in clinical care. We'd like to thank you all for tuning in and for the NPF for giving us the opportunity to present. Um, as David mentioned earlier, it's possible to donate to NPF, which is a nonprofit. And as part of our partnership with the NPF, they've set up a genetic testing access fund that supports genetic testing for pancreatitis patients. Please don't hesitate to send us any follow-up questions or any topics you might be interested in learning more about through one of our social media channels. And now we have time to answer some questions. All right, so it looks like we have a question about polygenic risk scores and if our test is validated in non-Caucasian populations. Um, so to clarify, Ariel does not currently offer a polygenic risk score um, because there's not enough information yet to um, create one that could accurately predict risk yet. Um, we solely offer um, the test results that I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, we return single variants back, so either risk variants or pathogenic variants. Um, another person asked um, if the slides for the presentation will be available. And um, the answer to that is the a recording of the webinar will be posted on our website. And uh, if you'd like a copy of the actual PowerPoint slides, you can email us at info at aerialmedicine.com and we can share the slides then. For questions about specific patients or specific genes or variants that may have I've, I've been identified, we recommend that you speak with a genetic counselor or physician to understand what that variant means for you and your family. Um, really, there are different variants and different genes that can cause both a single gene disease so an individual may have a pathogenic variant that's responsible for disease, or individuals may have lower impact risk variants in these genes 
that can be associated with an increased risk for disease, but it may not necessarily cause disease in other family members um, because other factors need to be present as well. Um, so we're following that JAR model that we had described. So if you have questions about, again, if you have questions about a specific genetic test result um, and, and what it means for you and your family, we recommend that you speak with your provider and your genetic counselor um, or contact us directly. Oh, this is a great question. So it seems that um, chronic pancreatitis symptoms do vary greatly. Is this related to genetic variants? That's a great question because in some cases they do, but there is still a lot we don't know about in terms of how different genetic variants may modify a person's disease course and risk for additional outcomes. We do know of several genes, variants in several genes that do impact, for example, risk from recurrent acute pancreatitis progressing to chronic pancreatitis and other end stage features. However, the entire genetic contribution to these different outcomes is not yet fully understood. Um, but we certainly do at Ariel tests for, for several of these. Okay. Um, in order to get genetic testing through Ariel, you must go through your provider. Um, we are a physician-only ordered test or other provider, um, so you would need to speak with your clinical care provider to see if our genetic testing is right for you, um, and if so, then they can order the test. And with respect to any questions about um, billing or insurance specific to your case, um, the best route there is probably just to contact our office and speak with them about your specific case. Um, they have a lot of um, background information that they could probably give you on that. Same with cost, um, that depends um, a lot on your insurance provider. Um, so that's another great question for um, our office because it would be more personalized that way. Mm -hmm. So regarding risk variance, the answer is pretty much the same with regard to validation in non-Caucasian populations. What we've found is that genetic variants tend to vary by population. So variants in Asian populations, for example, the variants that contribute to disease may be different than the variants found in European populations. Um, we are lucky in that there have been several large studies of non-Europeans for pancreatitis. Um, so ultimately, it depends on the variants, um, and it depends where the information on the study came from. Um, we do, when we provide our genetic test reports, um, we do provide a summary of information that's available out about specific risk variants. So that if you are getting genetic testing yourself or your provider that is getting a genetic test re report back, you can take a look at that information for more specific details about the variant that has been identified. However, that being said, most of our understanding of genetic risk variants in pancreatitis does come from European populations. 
So there may be risk variants, common risk variants in other populations that are contributing to a person's disease, but we just don't know that they're risk variants yet because we don't have that research and data on hand yet. Um, so in th those cases, for example, it could be that there are additional genetic factors that a person of non-European ancestry has that we just, we just don't know what they are yet at this point, unfortunately. Do you have anything to add to that, Katya? No, I think that was complete. Um, so questions about clinical trials for genetic testing. Um, you can go to clinicaltrials.gov. This is a website that will tell you all of the clinical trials that are currently ongoing in the United States. Um, and they also provide some information about additional countries as well. Um, so you can look through there and, and see if, there, if you're interested in looking for a clinical trial, you, you can look at that website to see if there are any that may apply to you. Um, and I also recommend that you speak with your physician because they may be aware of a specific trial either at their institution or partner institution that you would be eligible for. So regarding idiopathic chronic pancreatitis at later ages and genetic risk factors, we do know that pancreatitis is a complex disease and there are different genetic factors associated with early onset pancreatitis, which would be pancreatitis before the age of 35. Um, but there are also genetic contributions to later onset pancreatitis. Individuals with later onset disease don't tend to have fewer risk factors, um, but they still exist, um, especially for individuals with idiopathic pancreatitis. Um, so we know of several genetic contributions to late onset idiopathic chronic pancreatitis. Um, that being said, even genetic hereditary forms of pancreatitis can be um, very starkingly variable in terms of the presentation. So for example, even individuals with PRSS1 hereditary pancreatitis, they may not get pancreatitis until much later in their life, um, possibly even in their 70s. Um, there's a huge range of disease age of onset, even though most individuals with that disease do present early in life. Um, so there's a lot of variability even in people um, who have genetic risk for what age they're going to present at. So, so certainly um, there is genetic risk for late onset idiopathic chronic pancreatitis as well. All right, well, it sounds like we're nearing the end of the hour. Um, so we'd like to thank everybody again for coming. And if um, you'd like a copy of the slides to email us and otherwise, um, we hope to connect with you soon through social media um, or uh, through testing. <laughs>